Hello, my name is John Bindernagel. I'm a, a wildlife biologist, and this is the second of three segments on uh, some of the results of my Sasquatch research over the last 40 years. The first one was about uh, the anatomical description of the Sasquatch itself. In the second one, I'm very keen to talk about Sasquatch tracks because, as a biologist, when we see well here, when we see bear tracks in the sand, we're ready to tick off bear as being present in the area. Unfortunately, we haven't reached the stage yet when we see a Sasquatch track in the sand or mud. Most of my biologists and scientific colleagues are, are unwilling to tick off Sasquatch in, in, in their field notes or whatever. So I, I want to talk about that, that problem. Now there, there are some problems with tracks and that's why we make these casts. Tracks can be quite difficult to photograph. This one actually turned out quite well. The human foot in there for scale is quite helpful. This one is quite good because the toes are kind of uh, curled and pointed downwards and there's the kind of nice round tip showing there in the mud. And, and here's almost the, well, the best situation, uh, something loaned to me by, by Jeff Meldrum, uh, a very nice track which was subsequently cast and that's good because we have both the photograph of the track and the uh, track cast. This is actually an interesting to start talking about because it shows a characteristic of uh, some Sasquatch tracks which as far as I know do not occur in human beings and that is the relatively straight line across the leading edge of the toes. It's been described often drawn for us, almost never photographed, but here we see a pretty good depiction of it in, in a photograph and a cast. What's interesting about that feature is that that occurred in the first Sasquatch track ever cast as far as we know. Now that original cast has been lost but a tracing of it survives and this is the tracing of it here loaned to me by John Green. That was cast by a Washington State uh, Deputy Sheriff who uh, came up to BC let me just check this, and photographed, uh, a, or sorry, the, and cast uh, a Sasquatch track in 1941. So this is pretty interesting. This is uh, our oldest track cast or track cast casing. Now an, another uh, feature of the Sasquatch foot, and this is something that Jeff Meldrum has talked about a lot in his research, is that the, is the thing about the mid-tarsal break, and it's shown here when you get some full-footed Sasquatch tracks and others which are referred to as half tracks. And the half tracks are different from a, a human on its toes because a human on its toes it would only be about the front quarter or third of our, of our foot which, which would go into the soil where the Sasquatch with the, the foot sort of breaking or flexing in, in the near the midfoot the, the, the half track is, is pretty close to half the full size track. So that, that's an interesting feature about the Sasquatch foot, that, that different uh, flexing, different point of flexing. One quite consistent feature of Sasquatch tracks is that they tend to be broad compared to their length. Um, well, wide compared to their length, broader than the human foot or human tracks. This is a f quite an extreme example of it. It's a good example, but an extreme example from Pennsylvania, where the width of the foot behind the toes is fully 50% of its length. And similarly, in this rather small uh, Sasquatch track, only eight inches in length, the uh, width of the foot behind the toes is fully 50% of the length. Now that is of interest, the broadness of the Sasquatch foot, for a couple of reasons. Well for one because it differs from the human foot which tends to be narrower e even when the human foot does get to be 16 inches long or something like that. Now let, let's just look at a historical account here. Uh, back, It's from uh, Southwest Oregon 1904 and Okay, some miners on the Sixes River had been observing wild, a wild man, as they called it, <clears throat> uh, in, in their area. And it was picked up by an editor of the Lane County Leader uh, from in Cottage Grove, Oregon. So, so the editor is writing, talking about the miners, when he says they. They say he, now he is the wild man, they say he is something after the fashion of a gorilla and unlike anything else, either in appearance or action. Okay, so there we have a bit of 
physical description, a bit of behavior comes in here. He can throw rocks with wonderful force and accuracy. Now that's a very early report of this intimidation behavior that's commonly been reported for the Sasquatches. It certainly eliminates bears, could be human pranksters. Now this is kind of interesting. He is about seven feet high, has broad hands and feet, and his body is covered by a prolific growth of hair. Well here we have that reference to the total body covering of hair, the, the, the large size, seven feet, broad hands and feet. So they noticed broad feet already in 1904, and I find that quite interesting because uh, these men were ahead of it. You know, sometimes people ask, what did we know, or what do we know, and when did we know it? Well, we, we could have known about the broadness of the Sasquatch foot long ago. There's a couple other interesting aspects of the Sasquatch foot as recorded in track casts. For example, here's these uh, a pair of tracks from the Skeena River in northern British Columbia. Small round toes which are at variance with other tracks such as two, well here's one that my wife and I cast, the one on the left, and uh, two other tracks that are deer hunter cast just north of here on Vancouver Island. Long-toed tracks. And for years people were puzzling about the short-toed Sasquatch and the long-toed Sasquatch. Well, f well, if there was so, such a thing. And then came the track cast, 1982 came to our attention from Grays Harbor County, Washington, a wonderful cast in which the toes are held in a very tightly curled position, showing us that yes, the toes are long, but sometimes they're held like this so that only the toe tips register in the soil, giving the appearance of short toed tracks. Now, anyone interested in tracks and tracking knows that we don't, we can't just rely on individual tracks, but that the pattern of the tracks, the trackway, or what uh, the technical term is trail, in a very specific sense of the word trail, a trail of tracks shows us a great deal about the animal. For example, here is a trail of uh, grizzly bear tracks on a road. And first of all, there's both hind foot and forefoot. Second, there is this straddle or width to the trail. And here's a human trail in snow. And it's kind of interesting because we humans, when we walk, also show a certain amount of straddle or trail width. And in addition, when the snow is a little bit deep, we tend to do this scuffing uh, where our, our, our heel slides in and our toe drags out. Now let's look at the Sasquatch trail. Here's one where the animal, the, the, animal, the mammal, is walking towards us. And note the linearity, the, the lack of straddle. We can't tell from the scale, Hubbard, these are large tracks with a fairly large uh, stride interval. The lack of scuffing in the, in the relatively deep snow. And here's another one from Ohio, again. And this, is, this has been mentioned by people in the past. I, I remember someone saying, it's as if the Sasquatch was walking on a tightrope. That's how, that's how in line the tracks were. And we get a sense here of scale from, from the, the, the person who's partly in the photograph that this is a very long stride length. And uh, one more here, uh, this one from uh, Arizona. Again, only three tracks, but quite well lined up. Now, there's an obvious question here. If this track evidence is as good as some of us think it is, why have we not moved ahead and, you know, gone with this really good evidence and uh, attracted the attention of our scientific colleagues and managed to get the, the, the Sasquatch being studied in mainstream universities, government uh, conservation agencies? Well, there's been a distraction, and that is the distraction of hoaxes. And we should talk about hoax because it, it turns out to have been a very important inhibiting factor to Sasquatch research. Here we have a man showing two carved wooden Sasquatch feet, <clears throat> presumably made by his uncle, um, Mr. Wallace, uh, yeah, uh, some years ago. And, in, and he ca this came out in 2002 as an explanation for Sasquatch tracks. And the media loved it. They jumped on this and said, great, case closed. And, you know, we had headlines, a lot of different headlines. One of them was, originator of Bigfoot hoax dies, family fesses up. Another one, 
footprints big, but 42-year Bigfoot hoax even larger. Well, there's a couple interesting things. One of the interesting things is this second one, 42-year Bigfoot hoax. Where on earth did they come up with 42 years? Because we've already talked about a 1904 report describing the feet. We have other reports from the 1850s, 1870s, 1880s, good reports, good descriptions. Well, what they were referring to <clears throat> was this newspaper article, 1958, which is close to 42 years. I'm sure this is what they were referring to. New Sasquatch found, it's called Bigfoot. This was Jerry Crew, the, the construction person in Northern California, who kind of um, Mm, the, the Sasquatch became quite popular as a subject of newspaper and media inquiry around that time. And at, unfortunately, this is also the time when the Sasquatch was given the, what I call the unfortunate nickname Bigfoot, but, uh, which, which, which is problematic because, I mean, it's very hard, I think, for, for a scientist to take seriously an animal with the nickname Bigfoot. So, which is why so many of us serious investigators like to stick with the uh, word Sasquatch, which is derived from an Aboriginal name. There, there was, uh, anyway, so, but let's look more closely at the evidence brought forward for the Sasquatch as a hoax. Here we have Dale Wallace holding his, the, these fabricated uh, wooden feet. Look at the toes more closely. The toes are square. The the hoaxer hadn't even bothered to round off the toes. Let's look at another uh, one, of, one of these fabricated foot examples. This is from 1982. Um, Rat Mullins brought forward some carved wooden Sasquatch feet. And once again, what we see here, the heel is square. He hasn't even bothered to round off the heel more than just a little bit. So the question is, well, there's a couple questions here. <laughs> Sasquatch, oh, sorry, scientists who are not stupid have accepted the hoax hypothesis. They, they, they regularly explain and tell me that you, you, you should know that the, 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 the hoaxes explain Sasquatches. Well, no, no, hoaxes do not explain Sasquatch track, at least not, not according to the evidence that's been, been brought forward and that which, which was so widely accepted in 2002. Now, um, Two quotes here, if I may, before closing. One being, one of the first, uh, this, is, this is interesting, this is from uh, historian Carl Becker. One of the first duties of man is not to be duped, to be aware of his world. Well, I, I say this because I, it raises the question, who is being duped by these claims of these carved wooden feet explaining all the Sasquatch tracks that have been seen before and since, and have been cast as evidence. So I think that's kind of interesting because it looks at things a little different way. And, and speaking of evidence, a very good, uh, very good quote from philosopher of science Michael Polanyi on the subject of facts and evidence. And he was talking about two different uh, scientific discoveries that were being treated as controversial. And he said, but looking at these disputes more closely, it appears that the two sides do not accept the same facts as facts and still less the same evidence as evidence. So there we are. This happens, you know, with, with mainstream scientists involved in laboratory research, and it certainly has happened with Sasquatch research to the point, to the point of the Sasquatch having been treated as scientifically taboo, a scientifically taboo subject, which has been very, well, not only distressing, but it's been very inhibiting as far as trying, trying to move ahead. So uh, I just want to leave that some of those thoughts on tracks for now, and we'll go on to one more segment. Thank you.